that you'll open your Bibles with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 is where we're going to use as our launching pad text tonight for our lesson about our need to let it go. If you are here and you're visiting with us, we're just delighted to have you in our presence. Uh, if you're from out of town, I apologize for the blizzard outside that uh, you have to experience. It's very rough here. We're dealing with it as best we can. Um, Hebrews chapter 12, though, is where we're going to begin. And Hebrews was written to Jewish Christians who were being persecuted by their fellow Jewish countrymen, really their non-Christian Jewish countrymen. There was a lot of pressure on them to return, to submit to the law of Moses system for salvation, to get rid of this whole Jesus Christ idea. And the Hebrew writer assures them, though, that if they will stay faithful to Jesus, they will be rewarded. Because the law cannot save them. Only Jesus can and in Hebrews 11, of course, he lists this massive list of people who have been faithful throughout the ages to the Lord and have always been rewarded for their faithfulness despite the trials that they were going through. And so in Hebrews 12, he tells them then to follow their example. And in Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2, it says this, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, with the new year comes a lot of new hope, a lot of new opportunity, and a lot of new resolutions. In fact, at the start of the year, we all want to be like this guy spiritually. We want to be walking on the clouds, soaring spiritually this year because we're just so light and, and free and joyful in Jesus. But the Hebrew writer says there are some things that will hinder our Christian race. There are some things that will weigh us down and hold us back from experiencing the true joy and the true effectiveness of running this race of faith. And we're going to have to let go, he says, of every encumbrance and every sin that holds us back from serving God fully. And that is my encouragement tonight, to let go of whatever it is that weighs us down, that holds us back from reaching our full potential for the Lord. You see, we all want to be like this guy spiritually, but sometimes we're more like this poor bulldog. He has a goal. He wants to get through that doggy door with his bone, but he can't because this bone is just too big to fit. And he's frustrated because he really has to make a choice. Either he has to let go of the bone and go through the door without it, or he has to stay forever stuck on the same side of the door. He wants both, but he can't have it. He'll have to let go. And if we want to make it through the narrow door to heaven and soar spiritually in 2017, we're also going to have to let go. And tonight I want to use four portraits from four characters in Scripture to encourage us to let go of four things right now. First of all, we'll need to let go of the sin that easily ensnares us. Ultimately, we want to let go of all sin. 
But for some of us, there are sins that easily ensnare us, or as the New American Standard says, easily entangle us. In other words, there are some sins for us that might consistently keep us from serving the Lord to our full potential. Hebrews 12.1 says we need to let that go. Here's our first portrait. Mark chapter 10. Would you turn there with me to Mark 10? It's a man who needed to let go of the sin that so easily ensnared him, but refused. And this is a familiar passage to us, the rich, gun, uh, the rich young ruler. But I want to bring some new things to your attention uh, because I've just made some discoveries about this text that have really helped me recently. I used to be very puzzled about some things, and I want to share that with you and kind of my new thought process about this text. In Mark chapter 10, let's read beginning in verse 17 down through verse 22. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. And looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, One thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. But at these words he was saddened, and he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. I noticed something as I was reading this text again with with a fresh look that provides great clarity for me. I used to be very puzzled by this interaction between Jesus and this man, especially by what Jesus says to him in verse 18 when he questions him on calling him good. That always sounded a little odd to me. Here's the key. I believe this man knew his problem even before he came to Jesus. I think he knew that his love for money was a sin that so easily ensnared him. And I believe he came to Jesus looking for another way to heaven. Looking for a way around having to let go of his greed and his covetousness. And I say that for several reasons. First of all, Again, I've never heard a satisfactory answer on why Jesus says what he says in verse 18. The most common explanation I've heard and the one that I have given in the past is that, well, Jesus is trying to show the rich young ruler that he's divine, that that he is God. He basically is taking him to a logical conclusion. If he calls Jesus good, well, then Jesus is saying, look, if you call me good and God is the only one who's good, well, then you must be calling me God. So you must be recognizing my divinity. Maybe that's part of what's going on here, but I think there's more to it. Because why would he question him, calling him good? Jesus is good. He's perfect. So why would he say, why are you calling me good? I think it's because Jesus knew that this man thought of him as a good teacher, yet he was expecting Jesus to give him a different answer than God in his law. Jesus is tearing down any illusions that this man might have that Jesus is going to give him a different answer than what God has already given him. If this man really believes Jesus to be good, then he ought to know that good teachers, truly good teachers, only will teach you what God has taught you. They will not tell you something different if they are truly good. And secondly, Jesus insinuates that the man already knows what he needs to do. He says in verse 19, you know what the commandments are. You already know. And finally, Jesus at first tells this man exactly what he wanted to hear. He tells him what I believe he came to Jesus to hear. Because Jesus lists commandments number 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. And he completely omits the 10th one, which is the commandment about covetousness. And this man, after hearing Jesus' list, is so excited. He didn't say anything about covetousness. This is great. (laughs) I've done all these things, teacher. I've kept all these. 
And then Jesus, in a loving way, hits him with what he still has yet to let go of in verse 21. And it was the one thing he was not willing to let go of. His riches, his love for possessions, his covetousness. That, that was his bone that he wanted to try to bring with him to heaven. And he was looking for Jesus to give him permission. But when he found out that it was confirmed that his bone wouldn't fit through the narrow gate, he went away sorrowful. He went away sorrowful because he knew Jesus was right. He knew Jesus was right. And yet he loved his possessions too much to let them go. So I'll ask this question. Is there some sin right now in your heart or in your life that you know is holding you back? You know. You know that it is keeping you from reaching your full potential for the Lord. Or maybe you, like this rich young ruler, have looked for other good teachers to tell you that it's okay, that you can still make it to heaven as long as you live have you been living, but you can hang on to what you don't want to let go of? Maybe you've talked to friends and asked for their advice or read books other than the Bible, frantically searching for some justification or some loophole that will allow us to hold on to the sin that so easily ensnares us and yet still be okay with God. If that is the case, remember, no one is good except God alone. He is the only standard. And if you know what you need to let go of, but you're unwilling to do so, you're going to be, your Christian walk, it's, it's going to be sad, just like this rich young ruler. It's just going to be sadness because you're going to be trying to serve two masters, Jesus and the thing that you're not willing to let go of on the side. Free yourself now. You can't take your bone with you, and that bone is not worth it if it keeps you from heaven. Free yourself, let it go. Run the race with your eyes fixed on Jesus. And if you don't know how to let go of the sin that so easily ensnares you. Talk to the elders. Talk to me. Talk to Adam. Talk to somebody that you trust to give you biblical advice. Don't keep trying to run the Christian race with the crushing weight of habitual sin around your neck. Be like the man in the clouds, not the bulldog jammed up in the door. Secondly, let go of earned righteousness. Philippians 3, please. If you'll look in Philippians 3, this will be our second, our second uh, portrait here. We're going to talk about Paul the Apostle in Philippians 3, verses 7 through 14. In Philippians 3, 7 through 14, he says this, Whatever things... Well, let me set this up first, actually, because in verses uh, 3 through 6, Paul has just listed all these earthly qualifications that make him a genuine child of Abraham. He's circumcised the eighth day. He's of the tribe of Benjamin. He's a Pharisee. He was uh, zealous in his persecution of the church. He kept the law of Moses. But then listen to what he says about all that, beginning of verse 7. Whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. And more than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ, and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings, being conformed to His death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Usually when we talk about this passage about forgetting the past, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward toward what is ahead, we think about Paul's past in terms of his persecution of Christians and the, and the shame that he must have felt about that. And so a lot of him forgetting what lies behind has to do with him accepting God's forgiveness for that and being encouraged. But I think there's more than that going on in this text. In fact, I think there's something more primary in this text. His point is he has finally learned 
to let go of the false way of thinking that he can have righteousness without Jesus Christ. That's what really allows Paul to forget the past. What he means is, I'm forgetting all of my past efforts to earn righteousness on my own. That's exactly what he was talking about in verses 3 through 6, this idea of him being circumcised, being in the nation of Israel, studying hard to become a Pharisee, even persecuting the church. These are all his own efforts at, look, look how righteous I am. I, I'm just this uh, zealous man for God who studies and, and persecutes these Christians. And yet every single one of those things were just his own accomplishments, his own position, his own status in life, his own good deeds. And he says in verse 9, I'm done with that kind of thinking. He says, I'd much rather have the righteousness that comes from God through Jesus on the basis of faith, not the righteousness of my own, he says, derived from the law. That's what allows him truly to press on and to be joyful. And here's why I'm making this point. With the new year comes a lot of resolutions, maybe some financial, maybe some health resolutions, but hopefully a lot of spiritual resolutions. Let's be very careful when making spiritual resolutions not to put too much faith in our resolutions to save us or in our perfect performance of our resolutions to save us. Sometimes the thinking is, if I can just follow through on my resolutions this year, then I'll be righteous. Then God will accept me because I've read this amount of my Bible or I've done this many things for God this year. Then I'll be worthy of heaven. Brother, we need to set goals to do more for God this year, but let's make sure we know why we're doing them. If our goal is God has done so much for me. I just want to spend more time reading His Word because I, I want to know Him better. I want to draw closer to Him. That's good. That's a, that's a really good motivation for, for a spiritual goal. But if it's, you know, I only read um, 15 minutes a day last year in 2016, but, you know, if I really want to go to heaven, I'm going to have to up that to 30. <laughs> well, that's not going to go well. That's a burden no one can bear. You remember what Peter said at the Jerusalem Council? He stood up in the middle of this group of people amidst these Jews who were trying to tell people, look, you've got to submit yourself to the law of Moses if you want to be saved. And Peter says in Acts 15, verse 10, I have it on the screen. Now, therefore, why do you put God to the test? By placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. You see, there's a huge difference between setting spiritual goals in order to be righteous and setting spiritual goals because you already are righteous in Jesus. The first motivation will drain us. It will suck the life out of us uh, for being a Christian. We won't have any joy. We'll be miserable because we'll always kind of fall short of the goal and the standard that we try to set for ourselves to get to heaven. But if we understand that Jesus never fell short, and He was perfect, and He died for us, and because of our faith and we've been baptized into Him, we can have salvation. We can already have righteousness. That takes the pressure off of us on perfect performance and perfect following through on our goals, and it becomes motivating and invigorating instead of draining. When we try to please God and yet still hold on to our own earned righteousness, we're like that bulldog trying to fit through the door holding on to something that just won't fit. And I want to tell you a, a true story about Carl Walenda. And Carl Walenda was a famous circus performer and tightrope walker. And tragically, on March 22nd, Walenda fell to his death. This was in the 70s. He fell to his death when he tried to walk a high wire between two 10-story hotels in Puerto Rico. Now, Whenever you do high wire acts, a balance pole is the most important tool to use. It looks something like this. Now, that's not Walenda, but that's just an example of a tightrope walker with a balance pole. You can see it's like 20 feet, 20 feet long, and it's key to keeping tightrope walkers balanced so they don't fall, especially in the wind. But that particular day, when Melinda was walking through those, uh, between those buildings, the wind was blowing at about 35 miles per hour. And he knew, he had been warned, but he said, no, I'm going I'm to go through with it anyway. 
And it was clear that he was struggling to keep his balance, but he was already halfway across. So he didn't want to keep going. So what he did was he just had this balance pole in his hand and he just kind of bent down slowly on the wire down to the point where he could grab onto the wire. But the problem was he, he grabbed the high wire, but he also had the pole in his hand. And instead of letting the pole go, he tried to hold on to that balance pole and the pole kind of hit the wire and, and flipped, tilted upward and catapulted him off of the wire. I won't show you the picture because it's a little disturbing, but there's a picture of Walinda while he's still falling and he's only feet away from hitting the ground and he's clutching tightly in his hands, that balance pole. Don't try to hold on to things that can't save you. Let all your own attempts at self-righteousness go. Grab on to Jesus instead. And you'll soar spiritually this year. Thirdly, let go of paralyzing fear. We've used a couple New Testament examples. Let's turn to the old. Numbers 13. Numbers chapter 13. Recall that the children of Israel have been saved from Egypt and they're on the brink of entering into the land of Canaan, this promised land. And they send in spies to examine the land. And we kind of pick up on, in mid-conversation here in, in verse 30, and Caleb's very positive, but we'll see what follows from there. We get in Numbers uh, 13, verse 30. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, We should by all means go up and take possession of it, for we will surely overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are too strong for us. So they gave out to the sons of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land uh, through which we have gone and spying it out is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great size. There also we saw uh, the Nephilim, the sons of Anak are part of the Nephilim, and we became like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. Then all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become plunder. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, Let us appoint a leader and return to Egypt. You know, from a strictly human perspective, I can understand why they're terrified. These are slaves, not soldiers. They've been in Egypt for 430 years. You better believe the Egyptians were not training them to fight. And now they're finally on the brink of these promises being fulfilled that God told them about. They're so excited. And they find out there's not only are they going to have to fight and go to war, they're going to have to fight against giants, against these huge, huge men. So thinking from a purely human perspective, it absolutely terrified them, and it paralyzed them to the point where they just wanted to turn around and, and go back into slavery and go back to Egypt. But from a divine perspective, we can understand why Caleb was so positive, why Caleb was so sure that they could overcome him, because Caleb obviously remembered that God had sent 10 plagues on Egypt. He had embarrassed the most powerful empire on the earth at that time. Caleb obviously remembered how God had parted the Red Sea and drowned the most powerful army on the earth while these helpless slaves walked through on dry ground. He remembered when they came out in Exodus 17 and they had to fight against the Amalekites and Moses lifted up his, uh, his, his staff and God gave them the victory there. Obviously, Caleb remembered those things. And so from the divine perspective, their fear was absolutely unwarranted. Now, I don't know what 2017 holds in store for you. Probably most of us don't know what's coming, but there are some things that we might know of that are coming our way and scare us a lot. I know for me, there are things I'm afraid of this year. No question. 
I'm afraid of this evangelism class. We're doing well. We're on number three. I've got 20 to go. So <laughs> it's a little scary. It's a little scary, the gospel meetings I'll be holding this year. It's a little scary, some hard conversations I'm going to have to have with people. And when I think about all those things from merely a human perspective, my own abilities, my own uh, skills and, and experiences, I am afraid because I know I can't handle those things on my own. And I'll tell you, if I'm not careful, I'll let that fear paralyze me and hold me back so that I just do nothing or I just delegate my responsibilities to other people and sit back as a spectator. But when I remember the divine perspective that God is with me, I know that I can do these things even though they're scary. And that's what Joshua comes in to remind them of because you remember Joshua was one of the other faithful spies and he jumps in this conversation. Look at Numbers 14, continue reading with me in verse 6. Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh of those who had spied out the land tore their clothes and they spoke to all the congregation of the sons of Israel saying the land which we passed through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they will be our prey. Their protection has been removed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Brethren, let us not live in fear of the future because with God on our side, the future is our prey. God has been with us thus far. God will continue to be with us if we continue in faith to be with Him. So let's be strong and courageous. And let's remember one more thing about this. I read a quote by uh, a motivational speaker. Um, I don't really know much about her. Uh, her name is Betty Bender. And usually motivational speakers, they say really corny stuff. And, eh, you know, it sounds good, but it's, it's just kind of weak. This quote really, really rung true for me. And I know it will for you too. She said, anything I've ever done that ultimately was worthwhile initially scared me to death. Sometimes the things we are most afraid of are the things God knows are the most worthwhile for us to do. And God is trying in 2017 and in every year to bring us to new heights of spiritual maturity. And often on that journey towards spiritual maturity, we are asked to do things that are very scary and make us feel very inadequate on our own. And that's good because it forces us then to turn to God for strength and to put our faith and trust in Him and not in ourselves. So it's natural to be afraid, but it's disastrous to let that fear paralyze us and hold us back so let's let go of that fear so we can fully commit to the most worthwhile venture there, venture there is, and that is serving and honoring our Lord. And fourth and finally tonight, we come to our last portrait as we let go of despair. Would you turn to 1 Kings 19, please? 1 Kings 19. This is the time when two of the most wicked people ever ruled over Israel, King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. And you have Elijah, who is this great prophet of the Lord, who stood up to Ahab and had the courage to call him out on his sin to his face. Ahab said, oh, who are you, oh, great troubler of Israel? And then Elijah turned around and said, no, you are the troubler of Israel. You are the one who is responsible for all of the trouble because of your Baal worship. And that led into the contest between Baal and God, which really wasn't a contest at all, because Baal couldn't do anything. All of his prophets danced around and cut themselves and yelled out for hours, and Baal wasn't doing anything to burn that altar. And all Elijah had to do is pray one prayer to God. And immediately that altar was consumed. God was shown to be the true God. And Elijah ordered all the prophets of Baal to be rounded up and killed. But when Queen Jezebel found out about this, she was very furious. And that's where we pick up in 1 Kings 19, verse 2. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and even more, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And he was afraid and rose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. 
But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take my life, for I am not better than my father's. He lay down and slept under a juniper tree. And behold, there was an angel touching him. And he said to him, Arise and eat. And then he looked, and behold, there was at his head a bread cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise, eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. And then he came there to a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant and torn down your altars and killed your people with the sword. And I alone am left and they seek my life to take it away. It's really amazing to see Elijah, one of the greatest prophets of God, who had this amazing success in 1 Kings 18, this kind of mountaintop experience of destroying all the prophets of Baal and, and being victorious. And then here we see him slinking away in despair and hopelessness. All he wants to do is sleep. He's refusing to eat. He's asking God to take his life from him. Why so much despair? Well, it's because he felt like an ineffective failure for the Lord. He put forth all this effort to try to turn people away from Baal, and you really couldn't have a more fantastic display of God's power. What else do you need to turn the nation away from Baal than what he did in 1 Kings 18? And yet it didn't work. People still largely did not repent. The king and queen certainly didn't repent, and they're the leaders of the nation. And so Elijah is, is depressed. He feels like it's hopeless to even keep trying. There was a, a video clip released around November of last year. I got all my laughing done before I preach this, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna be good and keep it together on this. It was a really funny video. Uh, it was released around November of last year, and the clip was funny to some, but then the message in the video hit a little too close to home for others. It was a clip from the movie Black Sheep where uh, the comedian Chris Farley, a very overweight and funny man, rolls down a mountain. And he's standing at the top of this mountain, looking out at this beautiful scenery, and he, he thinks, you know, this is just such a beautiful morning, and then he trips, and he falls, and he just starts rolling down this mountain. And in Chris Farley fashion, he's just kind of screaming all the way down, and he's kind of bouncing as he hits these, these potholes, and he goes about a hundred yards until he finally gets to a flat part and he stands up and he starts laughing, you know, kind of like when we fall and we just think, oh, that was kind of silly. And he starts laughing for joy. He's so glad that it's over. And while he's laughing, the ground gives out before him and he starts falling down again and he keeps rolling. And it's about a 75 uh, degree incline and he's rolling and he finally grabs on to a, uh, to a little a tiny plant and he's holding on to this plant and he says, thank you, little root, you know, please stay strong. <laughs> and as soon as he says that, the root breaks, it rips out, and then he just keeps rolling on uh, down the mountain the rest of the way. Now, I said that this was funny to some because it is just a funny video. But what may have hit a little too close to home for some people was that the title of the, of the video was, how 2016 has gone for me so far. <laughs> and maybe that's how you genuinely felt about 2016. You may have had so many trials and hardships in your life that all you felt was that you were falling or you were failing or you were losing and there wasn't much relief. It may even be that you come to the new year with a little bit of a jaded outlook. You might think to yourself, I was so excited at the beginning of 2016. I had all these plans and none of them went the way I planned. I thought I was going to, you know, just be this much better, stronger Christian and things didn't go the way I wanted to. I was going to convert, you know, this person. I was going to teach them the gospel and they were going to come to the Lord and they didn't come. And all of this happened. 
And so why even try in 2017? Why would I even get excited about a new year when things didn't go well for me at all last year? If that's where you're at tonight, I first want to empathize with your feelings. That's what God did here with Elijah. He didn't just get angry and, and wrathful at Elijah and say, you have no faith. Get. He gently spoke with him. He tried to get him to eat something. He sent an angel to minister to him, to, to tend to him. And I also want to encourage you to let the despair go. Because we need to ask this question God asked Elijah, what are you doing here? <laughs> in other words, God's saying to Elijah, I understand you're in despair, Elijah. I, I hear your feelings. I, I empathize with, with what you're saying. But there's no good reason to stay here. In fact, God tells Elijah, I still have work for you to do, and there's still hope in Israel. Look, continue in the text. Uh, we'll just read verses 15 through 18. It'll be our final text tonight. The Lord said to him, go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And by the way, that word go is very powerful when you're filled with despair. God says, go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you have arrived, you shall anoint Haziel, king over Aram. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of uh, Shaphat and Abel Mahola, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. And it shall come about, the one who escapes from the sword of Hazazel, uh, excuse me, Haziel, Jehu shall put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. God tells Elijah, basically, I still need you, Elijah. I still value you. Go, anoint a king over Aram. And he tells Elijah, there's still hope in Israel. He says, I know you can't really see your, the results that you're having right now. He says, but I still have people. I still have 7,000 who are faithful and who have not knelt down to Baal. There is still hope, Elijah. Your work is not in vain. And the truth is, you may have been falling in 2016, but God may have been using your fall down that mountain to shape you into the person that He needs you to be to put you into service in 2017. So whatever has happened to you in the past, God still loves you. He still needs and values you in His service. He has work for you to do in His kingdom. <laughs> and He wants you to know that your work will never be in vain for Him. There will always be hope with the Lord. So whatever it is that's holding you back this year, whatever bone that has kept us stuck because we're trying to bring it with us to heaven, let it go. Fix your eyes on Jesus who showed us, who taught us how to let everything go in his life, even how to let go of his very own life to become the author and finisher of our faith. Do you have your songbooks? If you take your songbooks out, encouraging you to let it go of whatever it is that's holding you back from becoming a Christian right now. If you're ready to become a Christian, we're ready to help you do that. Put on Jesus in faith and the waters of baptism tonight. And if you've done that already and you've wandered away and you've gone your own way, won't you let all sin go? Anything that holds you back, we're here to pray with you and for you. Come forward and let us know how we can help while we stand and sing. Oh,